It reveals your cosmopolitan uh, bias to a shocking degree that in your mind, no, this is an amazing, this is an amazing moment. You're, being, you're not going to give three minutes for the American people I to get hear it. the real experience you're, you, of you, Donald Trump. There's one viewer that you care about right now, and you're being obsequious, no, you're being which, a factotum no, in order being, to please him, okay? No, and I think, you know, I've, you know wasted, I I think about, I've wasted enough of my you viewers' know who time. I, you know who Thank I you, care Stephen. about? Look, Trump immigration advisor Stephen Miller belongs in a reptilian cage. You'd be pretty hard-pressed to find a lot of people who disagree with the sentiment. But he's also a snake with a seat at the big chair. I'm talking about the most important table of decision-making in this administration, and you ignore him at your own peril. Miller, when not fighting with reporters, he was the guy who wrote Trump's doom and gloom inaugural address. He was also reportedly the voice behind the Muslim ban, and reports say he planted white nationalist propaganda in conservative media when he was working for then-Alabama Senator Jeff Sessions. A new profile of Miller and his wife, who is press secretary for Vice President Mike Pence, suggests they've become staples in the conservative corners of Washington, ensuring their voices will be heard even after Donald Trump is out of the White House hopefully in November. Now, we've got a lot of people in D.C. worried at that very prospect and parts of Miller's own family as well. Miller is Jewish. Miller's uncle took note of that when discussing Miller's platform of hate. Well, let me put it simply. Had we not been able to enter America when we did, Stephen Miller would never exist. It's hard to escape the conclusion that they want to disadvantage people coming from countries based on their religion, based on their ethnicity, and based on their countries and regions of origin. And put that in context with what we saw in Charlottesville. And for more on Miller and the threat he poses, let's bring in our guest, Jean Guerrero. She, an award-winning investigative journalist and also the author of a book on Miller. It's called Hate Monger, Stephen Miller, Donald Trump, and the White Nationalist Agenda. You know, usually um, when there is a, um, a figure, a public figure that's hard to like, you figure there's something more there that maybe they're misunderstood or whatever else. And uh, I know you went into this open eyes in terms of this project, but after finishing your book, it confirms all the worst suspicions. This is a person who was seemingly destined to be as disliked as much as humanly possible through grade school, college, and his young professional life, and he seems to thrive on division. Um, nothing you talked to and more than 150 people you interviewed said to the contrary, right? Right. I mean, I spoke to some of his friends who kind of defended him as someone who is being misunderstood or overly vilified in the media. But when you, you know, when you really dig deep into what Stephen Miller is doing in the White House, he has been pulling, you know, immigration policies and rhetoric and talking points directly from white supremacist sources. I, I call it a white nationalist agenda because when you look at what Stephen Miller has been doing, he's he's pulling these things from think tanks that were funded by eugenicists and created by white supremacists who believe in population control for non-white people. Um, and you know, from day one in the White House, Stephen Miller has been you know, working to narrow the focus of the Department of Homeland Security from something that has a very broad mandate to protect the American people from everything from terrorism to cyber warfare to, you know, pandemics into something that has been hyper focused on keeping out families, mostly from African-American and Latin American countries. Because, you know, from my interviews for the book and the documents that I reviewed, including strategy papers that Stephen Miller worked on, the goal of, of his policies is, is not national security. His goal is to re-engineer the ethnic flows of people into this country to keep brown and black families out, because he was radicalized at a very young age. You know, I delve into his childhood in my book and I show how during a difficult period in his life, he was introduced to these ideas that, that brown and black people pose an existential threat to civilization. And he has learned how to launder these white supremacist ideas through the language of heritage, you know, the language of economics, the language of national security, in order to make them palatable to, to a mainstream audience, you know, people who don't consider themselves to be a racist. But when you connect the dots, as I do in my book, it's very clear and undeniable that Stephen Miller is implementing a white nationalist agenda with the demographic, you know, goals of, of keeping this a majority white country. Now, that's bad enough as it is, but when, and you do in the book, you look at his family's history, um, 
and subsequently disowning of Stephen Miller by members of his extended family, it becomes even the more bizarre. His family fled Nazi persecution. Um, they, by definition, were immigrants um, seeking refuge in this country, like as we see people today coming to this country for asylum. The Glossers, one of which wrote a piece even in Politico, you know, reminded Miller where his family came from. And when the people were carrying the tiki torches in Charlottesville, they wanted to come for people like him too. How does he square that circle that the people who were as anti-Semitic as anything else, that somehow they're with him. I, I, I still don't understand that. Well, it is a tr real mystery. I mean, part of it can be explained by the fact that one of his key mentors, an anti-Muslim uh, extremist, according to the Southern Poverty Law Center, you know, he is also Jewish. So it's, it's very unclear how he squares this. And, and in the book, I delve into his family history because his grandmother on his mother's side, you know, she spent her entire retirement recording the family history for her grandchildren. She says, you know, that she's recording this for her grandchildren like Stephen Miller so that they never forget the value of people who come to this country with nothing but the clothes on their back and speaking no English, just as Stephen Miller's great grandparents came flee you know, as Jewish refugees fleeing you know, nationalist agitators and 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 you know and and you know massacres of, of Jews and and in the same you know in the same way that you now the same type of language and rhetoric that that you now see Stephen Miller using against brown and black communities. But this is a lesson that his grandmother tried to record for him and which he completely disregarded. You know, from a very young age. You know, as a teenager, he would go around his high school telling his Mexican classmates to go back to their countries. And, you know, he would go into school board meetings to argue against measures to improve racial equity at the school. So, you know, it just it, it truly is a case study in indoctrination and what happens when someone is, is going through a hard time. And, and you know, a, a person like David Horowitz, a former Marxist who, who became a right wing radical you know, comes into his life and, and gives him this, you know, framework to, to understand, you know, and to be able to blame and scapegoat other people for his problems. The relationship with Miller and Trump in that Trump is as transactional uh, a politician as I've ever seen. Um, yes, he's into things that are self-enriching, but for policy, he'll do whatever he'll do. I don't think he's really committed to much in the way of being an ideologue. Miller, the complete opposite. How is it that Miller has managed to survive? He certainly isn't out of central casting for the kind of people that Trump likes to surround himself with. It just seems like such an odd pairing, the two. It is, you know, it is an odd pairing, but it's a pairing that has been very mutually beneficial for both of them. And part of it is that Stephen Miller gets Donald Trump in a way that no other advisor in the White House does. And Stephen Miller, you know, he because he grew up in a very similar family to Donald Trump, same similar values, similar, you know, aggressive uh, stance. Stephen Miller gets Donald Trump emotionally and psychologically and spiritually. And he's been able to stick around because, you know, he's been extremely valuable to Trump. He is one of the main reasons that Donald Trump won in 2016. He gave him, you know, he, he got him the, the Border Patrol and ICE Union endorsements, which gave Donald Trump real law and order credentials that he wouldn't have had otherwise. And 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 Donald Trump truly believes that that Stephen Miller is necessary for him to win re-election again in November, because Stephen Miller consistently pushes Donald Trump in the most aggressive direction. And Donald Trump has found that when, whenever he listens to a more moderate advisor, he ends up getting ridiculed by his hardcore base as weak. And, and Trump hates that. He wants to be seen as a killer. You know, he's repeatedly talked about the importance of being a killer in society. And Stephen Miller, you know, he shares his instincts for violence, his fascination with violence. And, and he has his hands, you know, on the pulse of, of Trump's most violent voting base because of the fact that he has been reading white supremacist and white nationalist literature for so many years of his life. Well, again, the book Hate Monger, Stephen Miller, Donald Trump, and the white nationalist agenda. Jean Guerrero, thanks for a few. Thank you. When we come back, we will stay in the world of politics. In fact, we're going to be talking to our good friend, ABC News political director, Rick Klein. We're talking about what's happening on the campaign trail. But what about all the folks in Congress running for re-election? How do they feel about 
what the president's threatening to do with the post office, what he's doing now with the lack of a relief bill, and much more. We'll get into that after this.